Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the third Pet Parent webinar in PetShaw's Pause and Learn webinar series. I'm Danny Houlihan, Chief Veterinary Officer at PetShaw, and I'm your host and moderator for today's session. Tonight's webinar on separation anxiety is brought to you by PetShaw and Dr. Kirsty Sexel. PetShaw is a company of animal lovers, providing a sense of security to pet parents through pet insurance. PetShaw powers the pet insurance propositions of many well-known brands, including Woolworths, RSPCA, and many others. Additionally, PetShaw has revolutionized the claim experience with the development of Gap Only. If you'd like to find out more about PetShaw or Gap Only, please visit our website. Before we begin, I'd like to run through some housekeeping items. The webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes followed by a question and answer session. On the screen, you should see a control panel to your right. If you experience any problems during the webinar, please submit your issue within the question panel and I'll try and resolve it for you. During the webinar, all phone lines will be muted to reduce background noise. If you have a question for the presenter, please post your question in the question panel. The speaker for tonight's webinar is Dr. Kirsty Sexel. Kirsty is a recognised behavioural medicine specialist and is recognised by the Australian, American and European colleges. Kirsty is also an adjunct associate professor at Charles Sturt University Wagga Wagga and a fear-free certified professional. She's fascinated by animals and why they do what they do. She's passionate about helping people understand animals better so she can improve the life of people and their pets. Kirsty pioneered puppy preschool and kitten kindy classes, teaches the distance education course in behavioural medicine for the University of Sydney. She also presents at conferences nationally and internationally, runs webinars, writes textbook chapters and has written a book, Training Your Cat, and is also a regular presenter on radio and TV. So without any further delay, I would like to hand you over to Dr Sexel. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, I am going to talk to you about separation anxiety and uh, hopefully by the end of it you will have some tips on helping you and your pets manage, but I'm not particularly always sure that we're going to be able to prevent it. But let's go through and have a look at what is separation anxiety. Because it's a word that gets bandied around all the time. People um, recognise it. We know that separation anxiety happens in children. And some of you have had kids going back to school after this break with COVID will know that they're quite anxious about it. And certainly we see it in dogs and cats and probably a lot of other species as well. So Separation anxiety, um, we're going to talk about dogs and we're going to talk a little bit about cats today too. So dogs with separation anxiety are described as being over attached to their owners or people in general. Um, sometimes it's labelled hyper attachment, but, um, but generally in Australia we just call it over attached. Sometimes it's to humans in general and sometimes it's to their owners. Um, And what happens is these dogs, they experience real distress when their owners or their people leave, because for them, they want that company um, preferably 24 seven. What we know in some households, they may be more attached to one specific person, but maybe people in general. And, and there is a difference in that. So those of you who have uh, dogs with separation anxiety may tell me things like, yep, really attached to one family member. The others are okay, but if that member leaves, the whole world falls apart for the dog. Other cases, as long as you've got two legs, you're fine. And so some of these dogs, um, we don't notice it so much because it could be anybody looking after the dog. They can go to the vet and have a good time they can go to boarding kennels and have a good time because they just like people. One question that often comes up is, um, can they be overly bonded or overly attached to other animals? Yes, we sometimes see animals um, that are really bonded to the other dog in the household or the other cat in the household. Um, and that can be a problem sometimes as well. So I'm going to answer a question before it comes up. Some people say, if I have a dog with separation anxiety, would getting a second dog help? The simple answer is, not necessarily so. And we can talk about more of that in the question time if it comes up. So separation anxiety um, is also seen in cats, 
but it's less common. It's less commonly diagnosed. And I think that's because the cat behaves very differently. Dogs, when they have separation anxiety, it's really hard to miss 90% of the time. Cats, you might miss it 50% of the time. And that um, is an issue. I feel sorry for cats because sometimes they just miss out on being treated when they could be treated. So separation anxiety, clinical signs that we see, um, and I'm going to talk about dogs first and then cats. We see excessive vocalization. So these are the dogs that bark and bark and bark all day. Interesting, um, most people can recognize when there's a distress bark as opposed to an alarm bark. There's been some interesting studies uh, just listening to the vocalizations of dogs and even with very little experience or training, uh, most people can say, yep, that's a dog that's really distressed. That's a dog with a separation anxiety howl, partly because it's a very different noise that they make. They make a noise where it's like, bark, 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 and then there's a pause where they wait to see. It's almost like they're saying, is anybody out there? Is anybody out there? Am I all alone in the world or is there somebody else out there? So it's a different kind of vocalization that we see. Usually uh, we see in some of the dogs what we call unacceptable elimination. So they start to urinate or defecate inside or in places where owners don't like them to do that. Um, it's socially unacceptable to pee on your bed for most people, certainly it is for me. Um, we see dogs that can be very destructive in their behavior. Most of the destruction generally is around points of entry or exit. So they'll eat doors, they'll try and get through windows um, because that's where the humans leave or they can see them leaving. So that's the most common place we see destructive behaviour. It's not the only place we see it. If they do destroy the door or the window and get out, they will escape. There's no doubt about that, that we see that quite commonly with dogs with separation anxiety. Uh, and the other thing that's really interesting about these dogs with separation anxiety uh, or anxiety in general, they often do a lot of salivation. The problem is you might miss that. If your dog's been salivating all day, they might be quite wet and I'll show you some photos of what it looks like, um, but it might have all dried up by the time you come home. So you don't even know that your dog's been panicking all day. Um, you'll know your dog's been panicking all day if it's destroyed your house, but if it's just been salivating, you might miss it entirely. And we often describe these dogs as Velcro dogs. They follow you around everywhere. You go to the bathroom, the dog's there. You go to the kitchen, the dog's there. You go outside, the dog's there. And what we also have to remember is a lot of these dogs with separation anxiety also have a noise phobia. So if you have a dog that's anxious about being left without people, the odds are that it's probably also worried about noises. They often go hand in hand. And when we see these signs of separation anxiety only in the absence or what we call virtual absence of the owner. So we may see all these behaviours when the owner actually leaves physically to go to work or go to school or go shopping. Um, but we may also see it if the owner goes into another room and shuts the door and the dog just doesn't have access to them. And I've certainly seen patients where, you know, somebody goes into another room and the dog gets really panicky and pulls the door down, even though um, realistically they're in the same house, but the dog doesn't see it that way. So let me just show you some photos of what we uh, see with dogs with separation anxiety. This was a laundry that belonged to one of my staff members. Um, she went out and when she came home, that was what was left of the laundry. So you can see that can be quite destructive trying to get out. Uh, this next photo is uh, what you can see there is a door where the dog has tried to escape. Those brown marks are blood, unfortunately, because this dog actually broke some of its nails and uh, ripped out some of its uh, front, one of its front teeth. So they're pretty distressing photos. I'm sorry to show you this, but that's the kind of thing we see with severe cases of separation anxiety. Um, the next photo, um, is another one where the person rang me up and said, my dog is trying to dig. And when we started talking about it a bit more, it, the dog was actually trying to dig into the house because it didn't want to be outside. And again, there's the blood that you might see. Um, and it's very, very traumatizing, obviously, if you're the owner of one of these dogs, but also for the dog itself to do that much damage. This 
is the dog that's been salivating. It looks like it might have been for a paddle in the pool, but in fact, this is saliva and the dog was so distressed from being left alone that it just salivated and salivated and salivated. Um, this doesn't dry up so fast, but sometimes people come home and say, oh, I don't think the dog's been doing anything, but the skin, the, the fur is all sticky. And that's also an indication that you might have an animal that's salivating an awful lot. And that's just another view. You can see how much saliva there is because you can see it's actually dropping in the ground, on the ground underneath it. So these animals are very distressed. They can do quite a lot of damage, not only to themselves, but to their environment. Um, and this is why we really need help. This dog is just panting, when I say just panting. Um, when we see these dogs with separation anxiety, they may pant and pant all day. Um, they're gonna lose a lot of moisture. A lot of these dogs, when they're left by themselves, will not eat or drink when the people are out. So being by themselves is quite distressing. Again, when you come home, you may not see anything at all. If it's salivating and panting, the saliva's dried up, the dog is no longer panting, but you've had a dog that's been really, really distressed a long part of the day. Um, often people will tell me, yeah, I leave some treats out for the dog, but the dog doesn't eat it until I come home. Um, and then as soon as I come home, he has a big drink of water. Even though there's water available all the time, that's what happens when you get a really distressed animal. That um, panting, they're going to lose a lot of moisture, but they're not going to be able to drink because they're so worried. When do we see it? Interestingly, anxiety in general um, can be picked up very early, whether it's separation anxiety or whether it's any other type of anxiety disorder we might see. Um, in puppies, it's it's common. People often tell me they'll go to puppy preschool classes and the puppy's just not comfortable being left behind. Um, it's really, really important we don't ignore it. Martin Godbo, one of my uh, good friends from Canada, did a paper a few years ago looking at this and Basically, he looked at these puppies at their first vaccination and then looked at the puppies again a year later, two years later, three years later, and they still had that same signs of anxiety. So if your puppy's worried, and some people I know will have got new puppies um, during this period of COVID-19, uh, if you're worried about the puppy, don't ignore the signs. Um, it's really a shame, but people think, oh, well, they'll just grow out of it. They do not grow out of it. Anxiety is a medical problem. You don't grow out of diabetes. You're not gonna grow out of um, anxiety either. Um, so it's really important if you're noticing these signs in your new puppy or even in an older dog, um, that you do something about it. And they can't be trained out of anxiety, just like you can't train them out of diabetes. Doesn't mean you can't do a lot to help them, but training is not going to be the only answer for these these pets who are really suffering from being alone. The other time that we see separation anxiety develop is in older dogs. Uh, and, and often the owners will tell me the dog was fine, the dog was fine. And suddenly when it got to be a senior, almost geriatric dog, that's when we found these signs of anxiety. Again, it's to do with neurochemical changes in the brain. Um, as we get older, all of us, we get more worried about different things. I know when I was in my teens, I didn't think many things were gonna to happen to me. I'd traveled the world in my 20s and 30s. Um, and then as I started to get older, I started to worry about lots and lots of things that I didn't, wouldn't have worried about earlier. I know I was once at a ski conference and I was supposed to be speaking and normally I would go out skiing during the day. And I suddenly thought, oh, what if I fall over and hurt myself? Who's going to give the lectures? So I didn't go out skiing, which was really the whole idea of doing the ski conference. So I could have a bit of a holiday and, and do a bit of work at the same time. But things are just different. And, you know, I know with my grandmother's place, by the time she was in her 90s, it became a bit like Fort Knox. She was worried about a whole pile of things that she didn't when she was younger. It's certainly the thing we see in older dogs too. So don't be surprised that a dog that didn't mind being left alone when it was younger suddenly does mind um, being left alone. And sometimes I think it's got to do with their senses changing. You know, if your hearing's going and your sight's going, then maybe, you know, you need to check that people are really there because you can't hear them as well as you used to and you can't see them as well as you used to either. So just to think about, it can happen really at any age. So cats, let's just touch on cats for um, a little while. Um, what we see in cats a little bit different. We see cats that over groom. Um, you know, this is one of those things that people say, when, when I see cats that are stressed, they will usually start to groom themselves and groom themselves. And grooming is a normal 
behaviour of cats. They're supposed to groom. They're supposed to groom to um, clean themselves, to get rid of any parasites. But some of these cats go to excess about that. The other thing that people really notice is when the cat starts urine, urine spraying or not using its litter tray. There's nothing like coming home to a house that smells like cat pee that you know that your cat's not very happy about things or not using a litter tray. So that is again another sign of separation anxiety we see in cats. Um, and the other thing, interestingly, we do see cats that vocalise excessively. And I know um, councils always have complaints about dogs barking, but now we're seeing councils getting complaints about cats meowing. And some of the oriental breeds can make a lot of noise. And I guess if you live in a, an apartment complex and your cat's meowing all day when you're out and somebody else is not out, um, it can be very annoying. So they're the, probably the most common signs that we would see in cats. So. This is a cat that's busily starting to overgroom. He's only doing the tip of his tail, but he's actually um, taken most of the fur off his tail. And that's because he was getting really stressed. Um, this is another common presentation we see of cats with stress that they will um, lick the fur on the abdomen. Interestingly enough, that you don't always get damage to the skin, sometimes we do, um, but some of these cats will overgroom on their tummy, they'll overgroom on their legs. Um, Generally, it's always a good idea if you've got a cat that's over grooming or a, a dog that's doing any of those signs, take it to the vet, get them to have a look, make sure there's nothing else. Um, but these cats, often there's nothing else going on but stress and that can cause it. Um, this is one of my patients from way back when, it was part of a study that we were doing. Um, this cat had been to a board certified dermatologist like Dr. Houlihan and had been checked for everything. And this was a stress response in the cat. The cat was just plucking its hair out. And once we managed that cat's stress, then all the hair grew back really, really nicely. Um, but it was a matter of dealing with the cat's anxiety and of being left that caused these issues in this particular pussy cat. And there's another one of my patients from way back when, um, this cat was grooming himself so much that he made all his back legs um, totally bald. He actually licked himself so much that he got ulcers in his mouth from licking as well, which was uh, a bit of a shame. And when this cat got really, really stressed, not only was he bald, but he also started to urine spray. So he was absolutely delightful as a pet, you can understand. Um, the owner was very frustrated, but in fact, again, when, once we managed his anxiety, his hair grew back um, and he didn't spray around the house which is always a bonus, I think. Um, so I just um, put this picture up there. There's a cat that's uh, spraying a statue, kind of interesting how it worked out. But the other thing that you sometimes see with cats is this scratching behavior you can see. In fact, the cat that's scratching the post there is the cat that was bald before. Um, and scratching is something that is a normal behavior of cats, it's a way of communicating, but sometimes you'll find that they'll start scratching too much as well, um, furniture or other things when they start to get really distressed. He's actually being quite normal there because um, you can see all his furs growing back. So separation anxiety um, is generally associated with changes in the environment, okay? And I guess we're all going through changes in the environment at the moment. Um, Sometimes we see this um, when people have gone on holidays or are at holiday are on holidays with the dog or cat at home and the owners spent lots and lots of time together. Uh, so you might often um, I see people over Christmas or school holidays, oh, we'll go and get a dog or a cat. They spend all this time with it. And then everybody has to go back to work or back to school. Um, and that change in the environment can be really problematic for some dogs and cats. We also see this if someone's been unwell. Um, if people have been ill, they're often at home more. And again, the dog or cat um, can spend more time with them. But sometimes the dog or cat can be unwell and the owners spend more time with them, nursing them. And again, then there's that change in environment and that can be problematic um, when things go back to normal uh, for the animal. It's good that everyone got healthy, but it can be difficult for some of those animals to cope. We see it sometimes if there's been a traumatic event in the animal's life, um, if they've spent time in shelter or in kennels, and, and shelters and, and kennels aren't always traumatic in, in the true sense, because people who work in shelters and kennels really like looking after the animals. They do it um, because they have a passion for helping. 
But from the animal's perspective, it can be quite difficult. And a few studies have shown that dogs um, that come from shelters are more likely to have separation anxiety. But I think it's the chicken or the egg. You know, if you've got a dog who's destructive, who's escaping, who's barking, causing a nuisance, um, maybe that's why that dog gets surrendered to the shelter in the first place. So they've actually gone there with the problem and been rehomed. Um, so that again can be a change in the environment and can be traumatic for the animal uh, at that time because they've had so many changes. And change in household routine, you know, children go back to school, owner returns to work. And I think COVID-19, um, we're certainly uh, seeing some increase in anxiety in our pets. Uh, sometimes I think we see them because the owners are home, you know, more and more to see that. And at other times, I think, you know, you've been at home with a pet for such a long time, then you go out shopping or now you can go out to dinner. All of a sudden, it's like, mm, I'm not used to you going out and that is going to be problematic. There are some studies being done now looking at, at um, you know, what sort of uh, impact it might have on our patients. But seeing as we've still got COVID-19, it's too early to say what the results of that study might be. So what's the incidence of separation anxiety? Uh, when we talk about anxiety in general, we know that about 20% of dogs and 20% of cats probably have some sort of anxiety disorder. And anxiety can be perfectly normal. We should be worried about things. But there was one survey done on Australian dogs and they found that almost 9% of these dogs had moderate to, to severe separation anxiety. So not just mildly, I'm upset, but you know the destructive behaviors that we saw, the escaping behaviors, the self mutilating behaviors. So that's a real worry um, that you know almost 9% of our dogs have signs of moderate to severe anxiety. The next study I think is even more worrying for me um, is that they did this in the United States and found that about 60% of these dogs remained untreated. So even though these dogs had moderate to severe separation anxiety, the owners um, didn't think to treat them or didn't know how to treat them. You know, they didn't know where to go for help. And that's always sad. When you've got an animal with a medical problem, your vet should always be your first port of call. But some of these dogs just didn't get treated because I think people didn't know what to do about them. And unfortunately, that's where they might have got surrendered to. So this is a serious welfare issue if we really are here to look after the best interest of the animals. I think COVID-19, we may see some different figures. I, you know, as I said, there's a study going on now um, and I think we might see that the incidence might be different, but I guess we won't know until um, we get the survey done and we see what's happening uh, in the world. I don't think all animals are gonna um, be problematic when we go back to work. I think some of these animals, to be honest, I think are gonna go, phew, Hallelujah, now I can go back to my normal routine, whatever normal is. I don't have to deal with people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but I do think some of them uh, are gonna be, in, you know, find it very difficult to be left alone. So a couple of words about behavior and where, where it all comes from. When we talk about behavior, there's three things that determine the behavior you're gonna see in your dog or cat guinea pig or person for that matter. Um, there's a genetic predisposition. You can inherit certain characteristics from your parents and your grandparents. And we know now there's certain genes that are involved with anxiety. And probably as our studies go on, we'll find that there are genetic predisposition for separation anxiety as well. We know the second thing that affects behavior is learning, what you've learned from previous experiences, good experiences, bad experiences, in different experiences. We all take that on board and it does affect the way that we're going to behave um, in situations later on. And the third thing that affects behavior is the environment. We already touched on the fact that with separation anxiety, changes in the environment can trigger an animal to show signs of separation anxiety. When we talk about these three things, it's it's easy to think that they're three separate scenarios, but in fact, um, they're not. They're intricately linked. So it's not that it's just genetics or just learning or just environment. I always find it 
Um, interesting when people say, oh, he does that because he's a Jack Russell or he does that because he's a German Shepherd or she's a Greyhound, that's why she behaves that way. Um, it's not that simple. There's many, many factors to, that influence the behaviour that an animal's going to show um, at any particular time. One way that I like to look at anxiety and certainly separation anxiety is look at behaviour and emotions. And I think of these as a traffic light system. So what we really like as animals that are nice, cool, calm and collected, we like to be nice, cool, calm and collected. So when you're in what I call the green zone, um, you, it's, you're relaxed, you're able to learn, you're able to take in the environment, make very rational decisions about things because it's easy for you to take in that information and your emotions are at a lower level of arousal. When you go to that orange state, with or amber or yellow, whatever country you come from, um, when you get to that stage, things aren't so calm anymore. It's You're a little bit more aroused, you're a bit more worried about things. This is when you might see the dog or the cat being a little bit hypervigilant, looking around, oh, I don't know what to happen. Um, they're more unsure of what's going on. And the big problem is if you go into the red zone, and that's not a happy place to be. Um, when you're in the red zone, it's all about, I'm really worried, I'm really distressed. And, and this is when people often talk about the flight or fight response, and we'll touch on that in a minute. But in that red zone is when you see these animals that are panicking, that they're um, literally trying to break down doors and walls, they're damaging themselves, um, where that cat just can't stop grooming itself because it's in that heightened state of arousal and distress. So traffic lights are an easy way to remember where your pet is. Um, also for us, I think it's helpful, but I like to think of traffic lights like, hmm, I might get into the red zone, maybe I'm getting too worried about something, maybe I need to try and calm down. And that's one of the things that we can do to help animals um, not become so distressed and hopefully not get uh, uh, the, all the facets of separation anxiety that we might see. We talk about FAS. Um, if any of your vets are fear free certified, they will probably have posters all around the place of talking about FAS. And FAS really stands for fear, anxiety and stress. Um, so fear can be quite normal. We should be worried about some things, um, but it's very situational. I, I might be worried going to the dentist, but that's it, over and done with. Uh, whereas when it goes to anxiety, again, I might be anxious about my exams coming up, but again, it should pass. But when you get all three together, fear, anxiety and stress, that's when we're really having problems. And I think this is what we're seeing with these dogs and cats with separation anxiety. They're really stressed. They're really worried about things. Um, and it's our job, I guess, for their welfare to help them be less stressed, less fearful, less anxious. So I always talk about the four Fs. I like to have things simple for me to remember. And the four Fs is how I remember if you're in the green zone, if you're in the orange zone, or if you're in the red zone. So when you're in the green zone, you don't have any of these. When you're in the red zone, um, that's when you see the fight or flight response. That's when, and everybody's familiar with the adrenaline rush you get. Um, you're really worried. These are the dogs that want to run away. They want to hide behind you. The cat that goes and hides under the cupboard and doesn't come out or the cat that might hiss or spit or the dog that um, tries to growl or bite, they're really, really worried. Um, they're very stressed and anxious and that's why they're behaving that way. So that's the red zone. When you see animals um, that, do it, that are doing the other two Fs, that's when they're in the yellow or orange zone. The freeze response, um, is commonly seen, you know, we talk about the rabbit in the headlights, but sometimes we'll have pets that come into the vet and we're examining them and the dog or the cat is so good, just sitting there letting us do everything, but they're not always relaxed. They're actually frozen because they're worried about what's going on. So there's a big difference in that tenseness in the, in the musculature, the facial expressions, um, the way the ears are held. So they might not actually be relaxed when they're being examined, they may actually be frozen. And again, this is important for us to recognise when we're dealing with animals with anxiety, and you're gonna see this with dogs and cats with separation anxiety as well. And the other thing that we're gonna see when we have animals in that orange zone and early stages of separation anxiety, you might see this in your pets as well, they have what we call the fiddle response or the fidget response. Um, they're perfectly normal behaviours, but not in the context in which they occur. So the kind of things um, 
that um, we see a really, a really better called displacement behaviours. But because I like the four Fs, I couldn't get three Fs and a D to fit. So that's why I've always called them the four Fs. Um, and the fiddle behaviours are the ones that are really important to recognise. These are the displacement behaviours. They're normal behaviours, but they're out of context. So they indicate internal conflict or stress that the animal's feeling. And the common ones you might see is yawning or lip licking, grooming. Think about the cats that over groom, sniffing or sleeping. Um, so it's perfectly normal for dogs and cats to yawn. You wake up in the morning, you have a bit of a yawn. But if they're yawning when you're just leaving the house, when they haven't just woken up for a sleep, that's not that's not normal. That's when they're, you're telling the, they're telling you that I'm in that yellow zone, orange zone, I'm getting worried. Lip licking when you haven't just finished a meal, grooming. When, you have, when there's really nothing there and you'll often see the dog will scratch or the cat will lick and there really isn't a flea there, there's nothing to be seen, that's an indication. Sniffing is a perfectly normal behaviour. We see that dogs doing that a lot when they go for a walk and all dogs should be sniffing when they go on a walk. But if the dog keeps sniffing and sniffing and sniffing everything in the same environment, and I'm not talking about on a walk where you're changing from one tree to the next and there's always good um, P-mail messages to pick up, I'm talking about it's in an environment and just goes around sniffing the same thing all the time, that tells you it's getting worried. And sleeping, sleeping people think is normal and it is normal, don't get me wrong. Um, animals like us need sleep, but excessive sleep can also indicate signs of anxiety or depression where they're just like, I'm really worried. Maybe if I just lie here, the world won't be as bad as I think. So this yawning um, is, is a classic sign that we see. That lip licking is another classic sign of a dog that's particularly worried about what's gonna be happening to it. So if you see these signs out of context, because my dog gets up in the morning, has a big stretch, it has a big yawn, and then it does what we call a shake off as if she's been in water and she hasn't. That's perfectly normal. But if I see her shaking off at other times during the day, I think mm -mm, she's not feeling comfortable about what's going on at all. So signs of fear and anxiety, um, and these are very similar to the, what we've talked about with signs of separation anxiety. Um, we're going to see panting, we're going to see shaking, um, trembling. Often these animals will grab food as if there's something um, like they've been starved forever. Uh, and the animals that don't take food will also tell you that they're getting fearful and anxious. Lowered body posture, crouching, their ears are back, they've got a wrinkled brow, you can see the whites of their eyes. They're all signs that tell you that this dog um, is getting worried. And you'll see some of these in cats as well. The vigilance, um, scanning the environment, what's gonna happen. I always um, talk about these animals with separation anxiety, sort of sleeping with one ear open and one eye open because my goodness, you might leave and leave me by myself. That'll be problematic. Um, dilated pupils, um, that's also a sign of stress or anxiety. And again, we've talked about the grooming, the sniffing, the lip licking and the yawning. They're really the most common ones you're gonna see with animals who are starting to get worried. Are you gonna leave me? Is this the end of the world? And the animals that sleep too much. Now, what the animal does when it gets worried that it's going to get left, um, flight, fight, freeze or fiddle response really depends on the genetic predisposition, what its previous experiences are and the environment that it is in at the time. So a dog may exhibit all or none of those behaviours. A cat may exhibit two or three of those behaviours, but it's all about the individual animal. Just a quick word about panic attacks, because I think that's really important when we see animals with separation anxiety. Not every anxious animal has a panic attack, but they're relatively common. They usually come without warning and the fear is generally irrational, but the perceived danger is very real. Um, I know people who've had panic attacks tell me that they can't breathe, they're really upset, um, they sometimes think they're gonna die. And I think this is how these animals feel, because if you think about it, how else could a dog do so much damage to itself that it'd break its front teeth or rip its nails out? It's gotta be having a panic attack. It's not thinking rationally, but the perceived danger to the animal itself is very, very real. So separation anxiety, uh, again, there's some things that worry me about it, but there's some signs that bother owners or others um, more than other signs, but all of these are distressing for the dog. So the dog that's barking all the time and 
eating eating the front door or taking you know all your curtains off the windows and the blinds are coming down that's really distressing for um, you if you have one of these dogs but it's really distressing for the dog too because it's really not a, a natural or ethologically um, normal behavior Certainly urination and defecation in unacceptable places, we don't like that very much, but the animals, if they're house trained, they're not doing it to get back at you. They're not doing it because, um, you know, they've been left alone per se, because they feel like they need to get back at you. They're doing it because they're stressed. And most of us would have experienced that stress of having to go to the bathroom when you're really worried about something. And you know, sometimes I think the sad thing is that if you don't have this vocalization and destruction, you've just got a dog that's panting, you may not be aware that the dog has even got separation anxiety. Um, and sometimes I think, as I said about that study that was done in the US, a lot of people don't go to the veterinarian to seek help because they don't think veterinarians can help. And yet vets can help a lot of these animals. Um, one of the things that people sometimes say to me is, oh, he only has a panic attack occasionally. Well, I don't know, if I was having a panic attack and I thought I was going to die occasionally, I'd certainly want to have help for that. I don't think that's a, a nice or pleasant way to live. So my concerns, and certainly with COVID and what's happening now with all the changes in environment, is we're going to over-diagnose um, separation anxiety, that any dog that's showing certain signs, we're going to say, oh, it's got separation anxiety. And there's going to have consequences to that because some of these animals are going to be treated when they probably don't need that. Or um, the other problem I have is it's going to be under-diagnosed. So, you know, if you have a dog that is just panting or salivating, there's no visible consequences of the distress, how how much effect is that going to have on that animal long term? And that is a real concern if we're not looking at these animals, if we can't see these signs of distress. So we were going to talk about prevention. Well, what are the kind of things that you can do to help your pet not get separation anxiety or not develop a full-blown attack that you might get. I think if you've got an anxious animal, the predisposition is there, but there's still lots of things that you can help um, the dog or the cat. So identify the signs of fear, anxiety and stress. Look for those um, fight, fight, freeze and fiddle responses. And if you see them, um, think about doing something about it. Recognise that there may be a genetic predisposition in some of these animals, and that's something that we need to take into consideration. Um, and that it, it's not, people often feel like it's their fault or the dog's been in a shelter, that's why it's happened. But maybe it's just the fact that this is the way they've got that genetic predisposition. And because of the changes of the environment, that is what tipped the dog or cat over. Um, intervene early. If you see these signs and you're worried, see your veterinarian. There's lots of things that they can do to help you. And if your veterinarian feels that they need to be referred on to a specialist, they will do that for you as well. Um, so this is my dog. Um, I don't have her anymore. I had to give her her wings last year. And uh, she was 13 and a bit. And she had very, very severe separation anxiety when I got her. I inherited her because um, uh, my best friend died and unfortunately she had to be in a shelter until the lawyers sorted out where she could go or what could happen. Um, but, uh, and she also had a noise phobia, but I can tell you with treatment, she lived a very long and happy and healthy life until she was 13 and a bit. Um, and it wasn't the separation anxiety that got her. It wasn't even her hips that got her. And so for a shepherd, um, she did pretty well. But the whole idea was to, was to aim, I taught her that being alone, that wasn't the worst thing in the world. We were going to come back. She could tolerate that. And certainly it was really nice to be able to go out, know that the house wasn't going to be destroyed, that she wasn't going to jump off a, a four metre balcony, that she wasn't trying to escape, which is what she tried to do when I first got her. Um, she didn't need to vocalise and uh, get distressed and we could really help her with that. And um, she also had a noise phobia. And I so remember when, when she got to tolerate noise, as she could sit there and listen to the fireworks on TV and look at them outside the window and yep, it was all good. And that's why we 
manage these animals with separation anxiety. So how do we manage them? Um, we have to manage their environment, we have to uh, modify their behaviour and usually if the cases are severe um, or even moderate we might need medication as well. So we have to look after the genetics, we have to modify what they've learnt, that's the behaviour modification and look at their environment. But we also need to monitor the response. If things aren't helping then you need to talk to your veterinarian um, and see how we can help those pets uh, when they are getting really distressed being by themselves. So what do we do with the environment? Um, I think it's really important if your dog is really distressed about being left alone, don't leave it alone initially. It doesn't have any coping strategies at all. Um, people will often tell you leave, leave some treats and toys with it, but if you're really distressed, treats and toys aren't gonna help. Um, this is where sometimes if you can get a dog sitter, um, doggy daycare, board it with your vet, just in the early stages while we're doing the other things, just don't leave the dog alone because the more you practice being distressed when you're alone, the worse it's gonna get. At enrichment, and I said with caution, I think it is good to have um, toys and treats and things to do, but sometimes too many choices can be just as difficult as not enough choices. So they always need something to chew on if they're a destructive kind of dog and this dog has got a chew toy there. Um, but if you gave this little puppy five or six or 10 or 20 toys, um, that just might be too overwhelming for it. So it's really important that we give them things to do, but not too many much. And years ago people used to talk about ignoring your dog before you leave and ignoring the dog when you come home. Um, you know, the, some of the old textbooks I've read have said 20 minutes after before you go don't have anything to do with the dog, 20 minutes after you come home don't have anything to do with the dog. I don't think that's going to be helpful at all. If I've had a bad day at work and my husband ignores me for 20 minutes after I come home, I don't think it's going to make my stress or our anxiety any better. Um, I want him to acknowledge that. And I think it's really important that we you know, say to the dog, hey, it's okay, I'm home now. I've just got to get on and get a cup of tea and then I'll come and talk to you. But always talk to them, um, always acknowledge their presence. Remember, if you're anxious, you actually need information. And if you ignore them, you're actually getting no information and no information is very, very distressing to a lot of these animals. So how do we manage the environment? We want to avoid the stimuli triggers if possible. Sometimes these dogs with separation anxiety, cats with separation anxiety are very good at knowing that you're going to leave. Years ago, we used to do things like, um, if what are the departure cues? Pick up your keys, put them down, um, open the door, shut the door, pick up your bag, put it down, put your coat on, take it off. But those dogs learnt very quickly when it was, yep, you really are going, as opposed to, hmm, maybe you're just playing a game. Um, and that what happens is what we call back chaining. They learn that, you know, sometimes just the alarm clock going off in the morning means, oh, someone's going to work or brushing your teeth means you're going to leave. So um, avoid them if you can, but sometimes this is not possible. Um, and certainly I don't believe in picking up keys and putting them down and doing that because I think you just train the dog like, okay, now I've got to be really alert as to when you're really going to go. I do like, um, dogs and cats having a safe place to be that they feel that's home. Uh, I think crates can be really good for some um, dogs. They can feel very comfortable in there. That's their, you know, like it's me going to bed at night, shut the bedroom door. Yep, no, nothing. I feel nice and safe and relaxed in there. Um, having a bed, it doesn't have to be locked up, but um, if you've got a dog that's destructive, maybe a crate is better, a laundry, just somewhere where the animal feels comfortable. Never put them in there um, when, when you think they're being naughty. It's not a punishment. It's always a safe place, a comfortable place, a relaxed place that that dog or cat can go to too, because cats really appreciate places that, that, that are theirs and safe and nobody can get to them. Behaviour modification, what we try and do is teach calm on cue. So whenever the dog or the cat, and I do this with both, um, reward them for being calm. That's really important. We're so busy trying to teach them to come and sit and drop. We forget that they're just lying around resting. That's what you really want them to do. So I always um, reward them, whisper to them, tell them they're a good kid for doing that. You know, there you are, you've been a good kid just lying on your mat. That's perfect. That's exactly what I want you to do. So this teaches them to relax on cue and we want to reward that 
relaxed behaviour. I tend not to use treats for this because that can be arousing for some dogs and you can imagine for some beagles food is going to be very arousing. But I use my voice, I whisper, I tell them they're a good kid um, because whispering helps decrease the arousal of the pet and it certainly decreases my arousal. I find if I'm whispering, I'm much calmer than when I'm using my normal voice or certainly if I'm raising my voice. Really important that we don't punish them. These animals are scared. They're scared, they're terrified, they're frightened and getting into trouble for being scared or frightened does not make that anxiety go away. So it's really important that we actually teach them what we want them to do, lie on your mat, be calm, here's some rewards with my with my voice, I'm going to tell you a good kid, but never punish or reprimand them or throw them in the cat crate um, as a punishment because that is not going to help. Medication in the severe cases, they certainly need medication, but medication is not a quick fix or a silver bullet. It's not an overnight cure. We don't have a magic pill yet because if we did, we wouldn't be in the state we're in now, we wouldn't have COVID-19 and we wouldn't be all distressed about it, but medication can certainly help. It's an adjunct to therapy, so we use it with behaviour modification and managing their environment um, because we need to do both at the same time. It can certainly be life-saving, there's no doubt about that. Um, my German Shepherd, when she tried to jump out of a second story window, um, I knew she wasn't going to survive unless I did something with her more than just managing her environment. Um, so it certainly was life saving for her. Your vet might prescribe medications just situationally if you've got to go out for a short period of time. Um, they might prescribe medication that's more long term if you've got a really severe anxiety. They might prescribe a combination of both and the kind of things um, that I find really helpful in the early stages, certainly if you've got a new puppy or you've got a new kitten and it's just come into your house and things are going to change, using the synthetic pheromone analogues like Adaptal or Feliway, Adaptal for dogs, Feliway for cats, can be really helpful. They come in different different forms, sometimes diffusers, sometimes sprays, but for mild anxieties, new pets, they're just fabulous um, in just decreasing that anxiety for some animals. It's certainly not the magic bullet, but it can be very, very helpful. Um, Zilkeen is another product. It's a milk byproduct. Um, it works on receptors that might be a bit like if you have Valium to calm you down. Again, these are products you can buy over the counter from your vet and they can be really helpful for some animals. Um, not so much for the severe anxieties, uh, severe, you know, separation anxieties, but for the mild ones and certainly getting adjusted to new, new things, they can be really helpful. And if they've got a severe case, then they usually are going to need psychotropic medications. They're not designed to sedate them, they're not designed to change their personality, um, they're anxiolytics to help take away the anxiety and remember if you're anxious you can't learn so we need to take that anxiety away so the pet can actually learn that being by itself is not the end of the world by any, any stretch of the imagination. So for me um, the top tips that I would give you is what I call um, the three R's to prevent separation anxiety and help get back to, pets back to the new normal, whatever that is, so I'd be interested to see what happens there, um, is routine. Routines are really, really, really important. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to do everything some, at the same time, 6 a.m., 10 a.m., you know, 4 p.m., but routines make us feel comfortable and it, routines make the animal's life predictable, they know what might happen, they know that they're going to get fed at a certain time, they get watered at a certain time, they get walked at a certain time and having routines and doing those routines now, even if you're not back at work, um, getting that pet ready for you to go, okay, I might have to go back to work, um, now's a good time to do it, even if it's just a um, a matter of saying, okay, you're going to get walked, then I'm going to go and work in my office at home, but I'm going to shut the door so you can't be with me all the time. And routines that are predictable, um, that are clear and consistent can really help animals um, and people become less anxious. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is rewarding relaxed behaviour. I think so often we focus on the, on the frantic behaviour, the upset behaviour, but just rewarding the relaxed behaviour quietly whispering tiny little treats, yeah, you're being a great kid, this is exactly what I want you to do. Um, that's really, really important and I think we really, really need to focus on that. Um, and the other thing that um, I've seen a bit of problems with some of these animals, they need rest as well. Dogs and cats may sleep up to 16 or 18 hours a day, they need rest, you and I need rest. 
I don't think I could sleep 18, but it sounds really good when I think about it. Um, but rest is really, really important. And sometimes when we're with the animals all the time, which is, you know, if you're working from home and studying from home, the animals don't have a chance to rest and that can increase their anxiety because they're with you all the time, they're watching you all the time, then you want to take them for a walk, then you want to do something else. So time to rest is really, really important. Um, it's if you think about routines, rewarding relaxed behaviour and having the ability to rest safely, comfortably, um, you're going to go a long way to help these animals um, perhaps not totally prevent separation anxiety, but to minimise the effects of it, help that animal cope with when things go back to whatever the new normal is. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions if, there, if you have any, and thank you for your attention. Uh, and hopefully we'll, um, it's been of help to you in some way what we've talked about tonight. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sexel. So we do have quite a few questions that have come through. So the first one is, and uh, one of our attendees has just moved to a new house. Um, and since the move, her 10 year old dog will not stop howling when he's left alone. Um, they have a pet camera, so they've observed that behavior and it goes on for hours on end. Yep, that's the change in routine. It's um, it's a new house, a new environment, things are different. And I did mention before that older animals sometimes are very susceptible to these changes. If that dog is really not resting at all um, and it's howling all day, this sounds like a dog that's going to need a little bit more help. Uh, this is probably the time to go and see your vet, talk about if they, if you're, um, first of all, check out that there's nothing physically wrong because sometimes signs of stress and anxiety can look like signs of pain. So as an older dog, I would always want um, uh, your vet to do a really good health check, make sure there's no arthritis or anything else that's causing pain that may cause the dog to be howling. And then I guess if that has been all ruled out and the blood tests are all clear, I'd be thinking of asking your uh, vet about some help with some anti-anxiety medication to help that dog cope. Meanwhile, this might be a dog that, you know, if you could have a friend look after it or a dog sitter or take it somewhere so it isn't alone until it adjusts to the new environment. Things about new environments are very interesting because you think you're moving all your furniture and stuff, but what's going on outside can be quite distressing if there's dogs barking next door, cats moving past or kids making noise. Um, they can all be distressing to dogs, but I think a vet health check would be the first thing to do. Um, maybe some anti-anxiety and medication and certainly some behaviour modification um, as well would be really useful and good luck. Well, barking seems to be a popular topic tonight. So we also have an attendee that needs some advice about a seven month old uh, mini dachshund who's barking when left alone inside the house. <laughs> Yeah, barking. Barking is probably the most common complaint that councils actually have because um, barking is normal and I think we should say that right up front. Um, barking is as normal for dogs as speaking is for us and we actually bred dogs to be our early warning system. When um, dogs and people first started to be co co domesticated you know many many thousands of years ago um, we wanted dogs to bark, bark we wanted them to be our early warning system and do that and my dog certainly if someone comes to the door I'm really happy that she barks but I'm also happy she's got an off switch so that when I've said to her thank you that's great you've warned me that's fabulous that's great if the barking is excessive um, then it needs investigation and there is no one simple answer to that uh, dogs, when they bark, are communicating. They are often looking for information. And so trying to stop the barking, and it always distresses me when people want to put anti-bark collars on the dog to suppress the behaviour. The dogs are barking for a reason, and we need to look into that. So my advice is a seven-month-old puppy. You've probably got a puppy that's just starting to um, get into its teenage years, so it's going to be a little bit more... Uh, wanting information, perhaps demanding of, okay, so what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? Videos of that dog and seeing when it's barking, what the circumstances in can give. Um, veterinarians and veterinary behaviourists a truckload of information as what the underlying cause would be. But again, always make sure there's nothing physically wrong with the dog. Um, when the dog is barking, I think it's always good to acknowledge it because I always tell my dog, oh, thank you, that was really good, thanks, but that's enough, I don't need to know anymore. 
anymore. And if that dog is showing signs of anxiety, that's the reason it's barking, then you are probably going to need, um, I would probably start with trying a pheromone collar on it first or, or a diffuser. Um, but if it's quite severe, that it probably needs further investigation with your veterinarian or veterinary behaviourist. Perfect. Thanks, Kirsty. And here's one I can sympathise with. We just bought a new house and my favourite feature was the backyard. And within 24 hours, my three Labradors gave that backyard a not so nice renovation. Um, so this attendee um, is worried about their dog digging in the backyard, particularly when they're not at home. Yeah. See, digging is part of that escaping behaviour and it's, um, it, 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 and again, let me say, but digging is a perfectly normal behaviour behaviour of dogs to do, you know. Um, we bred them to go down rabbit holes, we bred them to do things for us and some of them are naturally bigger diggers than others. I think some of them actually, um, you know, are designing your nouveau garden, Dr Houlihan, so you know, be grateful for that. Um, may not be what you wanted but it's probably working for them but digging, the problem is, um, is where you dig. I've had dogs that dig uh, because they can hear the water in the pipes underneath. And so they're actually listening to something. They dig, if they've buried a bone, they'll dig that up. Um, we see dogs with obsessive compulsive disorders that just have to dig and dig and dig. And my German Shepherd had a, an element of that too until we settled down with her anxiety. Um, there are dogs who are so distressed at being, and I guess this is where your participant is talking about, if they dig near fences, um, they can dig themselves out. And that can be a real problem because obviously then they can escape, they can get run over. Uh, and again, this would be a really good idea to have a video camera, um, collect some information on when the dog digs, where it digs. Um, you know, is it is it trying to dig out? Is it at certain times of day it does that? Is it only when the owners are out or does it dig at other times? Because it can be just a normal play behavior, but if it's doing it at other times, um, then it probably needs more investigation. People think behaviour is really simple, you know, I'm just going to do this and that's it. It's actually very complex. If you think about why you do things, there's a lot of reasons why you might be chewing your fingernails or tapping your fingers on the table or, or you know, why you're reading that book over another book. So it needs a bit of investigation, but some videos, good detailed diaries, your veterinarian will be able to help you a lot with that. But I would be concerned if the dog digs when you're not home because then it may escape and that's when all sorts of trouble can happen. And they can damage themselves as well. That's uh, that's certainly something that we see if they if they're doing that. I um, had a patient in the other day that had been digging near the river somewhere and got uh, something in its foot and end up with a nasty infection in its foot. So digging, although it's normal, can have its consequences as well. Thank you so much for those tips. So um, we have another attendee who's recently adopted a six-year-old greyhound and this greyhound follows them around the house constantly. Uh, when they leave the house to go for work, this creative little pooch chews the blinds uh, and the wooden door frames. <laughs> well, good for you taking a greyhound. I think they're lovely pets, but I think all dogs and cats are wonderful. So um, just that I used to do some work for greyhound rescue, so I'm, I'm always lucky and lovely to hear when greyhounds make um, get adopted. But yeah, I think your dog sounds like it has separation anxiety because it's doing where other dogs are renovating your outside Vogue garden, this dog's renovating your inside garden, inside of your house. Um, again, that sort of destructive behaviour when it's left alone probably does indicate separation anxiety. This is a dog I would probably say first off, um, let's not leave it alone until we teach it some coping strategies. Let's work on rewarding that dog for being calm and quiet. I would probably be thinking about giving this dog, um, you know, a crate or a laundry, a room where it could be, where it's safe place is, where it has toys and it has um, food and water. Um, but again, this may be a dog that's going to need some extra help with some synthetic pheromones or maybe some more anti-anxiety medication because um, if they're getting to the point of destroying your house, and I can tell you they can do $10,000 worth of damage in, in a heartbeat, um, uh, it's, it's going to be worthwhile seeking some professional help so you're not renovating your house all the time. But it, that's a distressed behaviour doing those um, renovations, unfortunately. So start with keeping it safe, 
teaching it to be calm, rewarding it to be calm, get some routines going, maybe some pheromones, and then also maybe we're going to need some more help with um, some anti-anxiety medication, maybe just situationally just before you go out. Um, not sedatives, that's not what we want. We don't want to dope the dog out. We don't want it lying around like a zombie or falling over. Um, it's just to help the dog be more chilled so that going out isn't the disaster that the dog sees it is. Thanks, Kirsty. And we also have a pet parent who just wants some privacy. They have a Weimaraner that's a Velcro dog. This little shadow follows them to the toilet, into the yard, into the bedroom. Is there any way they can address this behaviour? <laughs> Sounds like having a toddler again, really, doesn't it? Um, and those of you who've had toddlers, you'll know how that works. No privacy at all allowed because everything has to be investigated. Um, one of my dogs does a bit of that, not not every time, but I always joke that she's making sure that when I go and have a shower that I don't drown in the shower. So she comes down, checks, and then she says, okay, you seem to be fine. Uh, yeah, I don't have to be with you. But again, that's a sign of, you know, anxiety and stress in that dog, that the dog that has to be kind of next to you all the time. Um, and that is not normal, you know. All dogs uh, and people and cats and kids eventually learn to be independent. And that independence training comes from, okay, I'm going to reward you when you're lying on your mat or on your bed and you're relaxed and I'm just going to go in the kitchen and you don't have to come with me. Here, have a chew treat, have something else to do. Um, I can still talk to you, I can still reward you for being calm and quiet, but you don't have to be with me all the time. If that dog is constantly following, and I do see a lot of patients like that, then that usually means that we have to do something to help normalise that neurochemistry in the brain because that the anxious dog that just for them it's the end of the world if you're out of sight uh, and we touched on this earlier in the presentation where you know you don't you can just shut the door and the dog goes no 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 you can't be on the other side of that door that is just too hard for me if you put them outside they'll go from window to window looking inside and that tells you that dog is really distressed so again this might be a good thing to go to your vet um, have a talk to them, have a look at some options. Um, but if they've got severe anxiety like this dog sounds like it has, um, the privacy is only going to come when that dog can learn that being by itself is not the end of the world. Because at the moment, that dog being separated from you is, oh no, the world's going to end. It's going to be dreadful. Um, as I said, I've got my dog. She just comes down, checks, ah, you've survived the shower, fine. That's good. I can go back to my own bed. Um, and that's fine by me, but being followed all the time, there is no privacy with that. Um, and you do certainly need, that dog needs a little bit of help to feel more confident that the world is not gonna come to an end when uh, when you'll you know go outside to the bathroom, wherever else you go. So good luck with that. And our last question for this evening, uh, we have an attendee who's recently adopted a one-year-old dog uh, into a multi-pet household. Um, and this attendee is having lots of trouble with toilet training, despite the fact that there's a doggy door that's always accessible um, and provides access to the outdoors. Yeah, multi-dog households. I mean, sometimes the dogs can um, integrate into them really well because the other dogs set the example that, you know, we go outside to eliminate. Um, dogs are, are very, they learn to eliminate on certain substrates. So if you have a dog who's only been brought up on concrete for whatever reason, if it came from such a, um, you know, a, I guess an establishment, then they're only going to go on concrete. If they've never peed or pooped on grass, that can be quite difficult um, for them to learn. It may actually be the doggy door. And I guess, you know, um, I don't know how happily this dog goes in and out of the doggy door, but there are some dogs who are actually frightened of going through the doggy door. Um, if everybody goes out at the same time, they'll follow, but they certainly wouldn't initiate going out through the doggy door. Not a great time of year to do it, but sometimes it might be worthwhile propping that doggy door open so that the dog doesn't have to push through it because you do have to teach them to go through the doggy door. I know with my dogs, I've always, you know, been on one side, rewarded them for coming through, rewarded them for coming through without having to push the doggy door and then over time get them used to it. Some dogs are better when they can see what's through the doggy door so you can get the clear plastic ones that will do that. Um, but I think the first thing I would do would be training that dog, make sure that dog knows how to go through the doggy door, is not frightened. I have had some patients where they've gone through the door, the dog's banged on their back or backed on their back legs and that's given them a fright. But if your dog's happy going in and out through the doggy door, um, that would be the first step. The other thing is with toilet training, it takes time to do that. 
so every time I would probably say I would go out with the dog, um, make sure it's on a lead so it can't go too far away, make sure it pees or poops or whatever it's supposed to do and then you reward it, give it a nice little food treat, quiet praise, not too enthusiastic, bring it inside, take it out frequently, pretend it's a puppy, um, you know, like you were doing an eight-week-old puppy and just keep rewarding, rewarding, rewarding the behaviour that you're doing. And I guess the other thing, as I keep saying, is make sure that dog, um, there's no physical problem with it and that may be uh, in, the, in the realm of, you know, the urination or the defecation, it may be, maybe it's sore going in and out of the doggy door, but um, rewarding the behaviour, being with the dog when it does it, uh, not, you know, just making sure the dog knows this is the place I want you to pee, this is the way I want, where I want you to poop and reward it every time, um, making that doggy door not threatening for the dog. Uh, and um, I think you'll probably get there, but it does take a little bit of time and patience and lots of treats and no punishment. That's really, really important. If you make a mistake, just clean it up. Not great to have pee or poop in the house, but it's uh, um, most dogs learn fairly, fairly quickly that that's, that's what they need to do is outside is where our preferred toilet for them is. Good luck. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsty. So thanks once again for all those questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time today. Thank you all again for attending the webinar. We hope you enjoyed the session. A very special thanks to Dr. Sexel for putting together today's presentation and for giving up her time to share her knowledge and experience with us. Please remember to register for the next Pause and Learn webinar hosted by our very own Dr. Oliver Conradi on getting the most out of your pet insurance. If you'd like to learn more about GAP Only, PetSure or the Pause and Learn webinar series, please follow us on social or visit our website. Thanks so much again for joining us and good evening.